Hi, I'm Sam Fesich from the EduMagic Podcast, a part of the Education Podcast Network, just like the show you're listening to now. Shows on the network are individually owned and opinions expressed may not reflect others. Find other interesting education podcasts at edupodcastnetwork.com. Support for today's episode comes from Wipebook. More about them later in the episode, which includes my EdTech thought on social media for educators, my EdTech recommendation, we're going to talk a little Canva, I've got a House of EdTech VIP, I've got a great conversation with the EdTech guru, Lena Marie Saleh, about the impact of social media in education, and a whole lot more. Strike up the band. Welcome to the House of EdTech. My name is Chris Nessie. The House of EdTech launched in 2014, giving me the opportunity to speak with teachers, leaders, and creators so you can more effectively integrate technology, strengthen your pedagogy, and have more confidence in your classroom and school so you can make an impact. Get involved with the podcast by visiting my website, chrisnessie.com. Using technology isn't difficult, and this is where it begins. This is the House of EdTech. And March Madness continues. Welcome back to the podcast. If it's your first time listening, welcome aboard. If you're a returning listener, welcome back. Great episode planned for you today. I am so excited to share a recent conversation I had with Lena Marie Saleh with you. But first, number one, first and foremost, I'm releasing this episode on March 12th, and I have to give a big birthday shout out to my 11-year-old son, Miles Nessie. He was one of the first people whose voice you heard on the podcast uh, as a uh, prom- promoter of the podcast. Uh, you used to hear his voice in some of the early episodes, and uh, certainly thankful to him for that. He's been a guest on the podcast twice, and he is my podcast partner on the Knock Knock Who's There podcast that we produce together, he and I. So, happy 11th birthday to my oldest son. More in line with education, want to give a special Education Podcast Network shout-out to two members of the network who have collaborated with each other. One voice you heard right here at the top of the episode, Sam Fesich, host of the EduMagic podcast. And I also want to shout-out Matthew Woods, host of Leading Out the Woods. Sam and Matt collaborated on a book, and it is available now, and it is called Digital PD for Educators. Congratulations to Matt and Sam on this collaboration, and the book is described as follows. Growing and learning is a continuous process for everyone, including educators, Let us guide you through the different digital professional development opportunities that can strengthen your practice and confidence in your classroom. So shout out to Matt and Sam for this awesome book, which was released on March 6th. I will have a link to it in the show notes out at chrisnessy.com slash 220. So if you want to support Matt and Sam, definitely check out their book and congratulations on the collaboration. Now we're going to get into this episode and I am going to first share my EdTech recommendation. If you thought I was done talking about artificial intelligence, you couldn't be more incorrect. So I've got some more AI to share with you. And today I want to recommend a very cool AI-based tool called Auto Classmate. You can find it at autoclassmate.io. And there's a link that is a swipe or a tap away in the show notes. But what this does, Auto Classmate, generates activities for you to do. And it is AI powered. I I really don't know what more to say, but I am on their page and here are the instructions for using the activity, the words are hard folks, the activation and engagement activity generator. 
select a grade level of your students, describe what you want your students to learn from the activities, and then click AI Generate Response, and then wait for your activities to generate. You got to wait at least 30 seconds for the AI model to work its magic, but then you select your grade level. It's got a box where you put in, I want my students to learn, and you put in basically your objective, and then you generate responses. So I have done that in advance, and here's the prompt that I put in. I want students to learn about the impact and importance of imperialism in world history. And it generated the following three activities. Number one, an imperialism scavenger hunt. And it says students will be given a list of key events and movements related to imperialism, such as the Scramble for Africa, the Opium Wars, and the Boxer Rebellion. They will work in pairs to research and gather information about each topic by using classroom resources or researching online. Once they have completed their research, they will present their findings to the class, explaining the significance of each event and its impact on world history. This activity will help students to develop research skills and critical thinking abilities, as well as to understand the complexity of imperialism as a historical phenomenon. The number two activity is about mapping your own culture. And the number three activity is an imperialism debate. This is a very cool AI tool, and they've got some other AI tools available as well. One is called, as I just said, the activity. The, the activation and engagement activity generator. And the other is a very simple, would you rather question generator. And coming soon, according to their website, autoclassmate.io slash tools is a lesson plan and activity forecast tool, which they are promoting as uh, a tool that will make you feel like you can see the future by predicting outcomes of any activity within your lesson plan. So you can preview class before class. Now, I will also say here in this EdTech Thought that I have reached out to Logan Greenhaw, who is the creator behind autoclass.io, and uh, he's got an invitation that he's accepted to come on in a future episode and really talk about what this tool can do. So I'm looking forward to bringing Logan on to the podcast. But if you want to check this out now, you can go to autoclassmate.io and you can also connect with Logan. He is at Logan Greenhaw on Twitter. And there will, of course, be a link to the show notes, uh, to both of these in the show notes over at chrisnessy.com slash 220. Or they are a swipe or a tap away in your podcast player right now. So check out Auto Classmate. And that's my tech recommendation. <music> And now let's dig right into the featured content of this episode, my conversation with the EdTech guru, Lena Marie Saleh. Welcome back to the House of EdTech, Lena Marie Saleh. Hello. Thank you so much for having me back again on my favorite podcast. I... Appreciate you saying that. And when it's somebody's favorite podcast, I like to bring them back on repeatedly because they know what they're doing. Yeah. So everyone, you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> if you're not familiar, she has been on the podcast two other times. She was on episode 184. She contributed some tech tips to start the school year. And one of my favorite episodes in the whole catalog, episode 190, where we rapped and rhymed about ed tech truth bombs. And now we're back because today we're going to be talking about the impact of social media in education. One of my favorite topics and your favorite episode in the whole catalog. That's like really big shoes to fill. I hold on. Time out. You misheard me. I said one of my favorite oh, episodes in the whole me. catalog. <laughs> okay. Excuse me. Sorry about that. You just slid right into the top spot. Hey, good try. <laughs> All right. So what has been your experience with social media? in education. You are in this profession more than 10 years and social media changes by the minute. So 
What have you seen? What's your perspective? But let's talk. I think social media used to be something that was like super feared. And it was like, don't post anything. Don't share anything. You would have, um, I was like one of the first adopters of like bringing Facebook, like having a Facebook page for my classroom. I just think social media is a necessary evil that we need to have. But I think more importantly, it has evolved into this place where you can share teaching tips, students can learn from you, and you also can expand your personal learning network or your personal learning community, wherever you call it, wherever you are. Um, so it just is a, it's just something that is not going to go away and something that is really important that you, that you participate in. Would you consider yourself an avid user? And by that, I mean, are you addicted to social media at this point in your life? Mm, yeah, I would say I definitely have a small addiction to social media. Um, I just find that there is a lot to learn. And I think social media is a really great place to do that, especially being removed from the classroom. Even though I still serve educators and still work, you know, in the world of ed tech, I find that it's the best way that I can connect and learn from others. I think that's been one of the biggest benefits for me. I mean, I, I was on MySpace and I was on and off Facebook when you could only be a college student mm -hmm. to get access to it. I, I know I'm older than you, so I don't know if you were I Facebook had the same. college user. Okay. Yeah. All right, cool. All right. So you're old now. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, for me, it was Twitter and getting into and onto Twitter, I believe in 2009, I was not one of the first users, but I would consider myself an early adopter of getting onto Twitter and being able to connect with other educators. And that started first with connecting with other people here in New Jersey and then kind of opening the floodgates to, wow, I have a way now to talk to, ask questions, and it gives a way to put my ideas out onto the internet based on my own classroom experiences. So it wasn't me using Twitter to say, I had an egg salad sandwich for lunch today. Hashtag hungry, no more. <laughs> Yeah, I think Twitter, I think Twitter is an interesting one. I am not the best at using Twitter. I like to follow a lot of things and that's where I do the bulk of my research, I would say, for like just following what teachers are doing and trends and different things like that. But um, I have seen a lot of teachers create a lot of really good relationships and just a, a network of learning that I think is hard to come by in most of the other, I'm not saying it doesn't happen in others like Facebook groups or things like that, but I think I think it just allows you to connect to like just on such a global scale, which I think is really neat to well, see. I, I think what you just described, that can happen on any of the platforms. I mean, there right now I would say, you know, educator TikTok, which I've been talking about for a couple of years now, is, is big. And there is certainly this opportunity to build community on any platform, you know, d different strokes for different folks, right? But I want to go back to something you said about, you know, connecting with people. And I think that that sometimes gets lost. Maybe this conversation takes a turn. A lot of self-promotion and not a lot of conversation. Yes, there are still Twitter chats, which I'm going to be perfectly honest. And anybody who has listened to this show knows, you know, I'm not really in love with Twitter chats at this point. I would have thought that they would have evolved, right? You know, one of the reasons why I have this show is because I got frustrated with social media and literally wanted to find a better way to communicate what I thought, which I think has value. That led me to podcasting. So social media was a gateway drug to content creation. <laughs> I like that. The gateway drug to content creation. Um, yeah, I think the I think the piece of connecting with others, you're right. It has turned Twitter has sort of turned into this advertising platform, I think, with a lot of like the influencers and and I'm not saying that's wrong. I'm not saying anything either way, but I am seeing that there is a lack of engagement, like a two-way engagement between people. It's like, hey, check out my stuff. And then it's kind of like, oh, I love it. Like that sort of a thing, kind of like fangirling, like in the comments sort of a thing versus if, what if it used to be. you even get comments, mm -hmm. right? So many people, myself included, you know, we put out or people put out what we think is engaging or valuable and there, there's so much noise. You know, I've got, you know, almost 8,000 followers on Twitter and, you know, I, I can see the stats on my tweets and I think other people can see them too. Like nobody sees them. Yeah. What's the point? Yeah. I think that, I think that it has been tricky. You're right. It has gotten, I don't know, very like convoluted, I guess. Like it, there's just like so much and what you're saying, there's so much noise. And so 
I've actually, me personally, kind of like pulled back from Twitter a bit. And I found that I think there is like the the TikToks and the, you know, Instagrams. And I hear of like lots of the big communities, but I just find, I find it's very hard to like interact and engage like in a thread of like a TikTok or like in the thread of like an Instagram. So I've actually just found like there are some really great like LinkedIn groups. And I think that's sometimes hidden for teachers. And I think that space is less concentrated. Um, and then obviously like the Facebook groups, I think people are still asking a lot of questions and asking a lot of advice. And I just think that that's what Twitter used to be. And I'm not seeing as much of that happen as it used to, I guess you would say. That's true. I kind of laugh to myself when I see, you know, somebody on TikTok who has, you know, let's say 150,000 followers. Those are not 150,000 teachers all consuming this person's content. And then you go and you see them and you look them up on like Twitter or Instagram and they've got like 200 followers, right? And they're putting the same content out. Kudos to people who can rack up the followers, but I think the engagement is the bigger piece. You know, Mm -hmm. it's one thing to, you know, throw it out into the void that is the internet, but can you really make a difference if people aren't, consuming it or seeing it, or if you're not reaching the right people, Mm -hmm. right? Would would I love it if everybody listened to the House of Ed Tech on the planet? Sure. But this is a very niche topic within the world of education, which is a niche profession. Yeah. I I think I'm just thinking about the the Twitter piece and and you're right, like the engagement piece. And I think that's where I guess we're starting to see kind of that like decline is like so many people are are like me on Twitter as being like voyeurs, I like to say, um, you know, just like following and looking for research and things, but the interaction is become few and far between. It's just like liking. Hold on. I'm going to jump in. So oh, okay. Earl, before you, you said something about like, you go to Twitter for like research and mm-hmm. just to kind of see what the trends are. What does that mean for you? Because you're in the education space, yeah, but you're not in the classroom right now. So what does that mean when you're saying you're looking at trends and and some of these things you're looking for? What does That's that mean? A good question. So um, when teachers are posting and using hashtags, which makes it the easiest, I know some people have kind of moved away from that, but they're actually really important even from a brand perspective. So like Canva, they're looking for something they'll basically filter by specific hashtags. So um, for example, like our Canva learning consultants, they have a specific hashtag. So we look at the hashtag and see how much engagement's happening, what sorts of conversations are there. Um, so I like to follow, you know, like the edu Twitter, the ed tech ones. And so I'll go to tweet deck. If you haven't used that, so I recommend it. And I'll just kind of filter based on that. You can also exclude specific people from that if you're not looking for it. And I'll basically see what sorts of conversations are happening. I did the same thing when I was at code monkey. I would search by specific, you know, computer science or specific hashtag and just kind of see what everyone was saying, what sorts of engagement was happening. What are the top things that teachers are engaging with the most? And that's sort of what we look for. And that's what I look for as well. So I follow like ed tech. So I follow you. I'll follow, you know, other people and see like, what are they talking about? What are the top things that are happening? What are the pain points? Because you'll find hidden gems of like, I remember during the pandemic, I found like a whole Twitter thread about obviously teachers and being disgruntled, but then it led me to like a spreadsheet of where people were just dumping in all these things that were happening to them and like all their, you know, do you ever follow like the teacher misery account? Uh, no, I try not to look at the negatives. <laughs> yeah. But it basically was that, but like full blast, like in a full spreadsheet of like, and there were hundreds of thousands of like these sorts of things. So there's sorts of those like pain points, but I think there are learnings that happen from the pain points. It's like, what is it the things that educators are facing? Is it professional development? Is it personally? Is it the environment? That sort of thing. So I'm looking for what sorts of things are teachers engaging with? What are the current like trends? You know, like right now we're talking about AI and those types of things, but there are other deeper things like how are teachers going to build their personal, you know, learning networks and how are they leveraging that to like get better at their crafts or, you know, to kind of leverage the world that we live in no longer is in isolation. I think, I think COVID opened Pandora's box for a lot of people. You've been an early adopter of technology. I've been an early adopter of technology, but most educators are not there. So I think the pandemic basically opened up and was like, Hey, you can actually collaborate with a teacher. If you're feeling miserable or you're not feeling happy, you can actually collaborate with someone in Missouri. You could collaborate with someone in Israel. You could collaborate with anyone anywhere and you could do co-teaching in a different scale and a different magnitude. And I think that that's the best thing that has come out of social media. 
I, I can't argue with that. Mike, Mike drop um, <laughs> the, the idea of so many doors being opened. And, you know, one of the things I talked about many years ago was the idea that using social media, whether it was at the time, you know, Twitter or Facebook or, you know, some of the, the newer platforms, is it knocked down the walls of our classroom. I, I think some of the early, there's got to be an early episode where I talked about, you know, social media knocking down the walls of your classroom and you're not just teaching on an island anymore and closing your door and it's just you and your 25 to 30 kids, right? Yep. So do you think that social media is still worth engaging in for teachers? I do. I think that our worlds still a lot of teacher are facing, you know, those are teacher miseries. Those those Facebook threads of like, you know, people complaining and different things like that. But I think misery loves company. So be very, very careful with that. But what I do think is that teachers, what it shows us that teachers are having still and will always have these really big pain points of feeling isolated because it is a very isolated space, specifically um, in like the elementary space to just just speaking to my experience is like, you, you do one thing and you do one thing by yourself. Like you plan for every single lesson, you do everything all by yourself all day long. And there's not really like a lot of cloth cla like cross collaboration that happens. And so I think, but that's the same for like all of education, right? Like everyone is, feels very isolated and kind of sometimes on their own Island, but you don't have to be my, t my sister teaches uh, high school social studies. And I always tell her, like, she's always like, you know, I feel so alone. I'm like, there's such a world out there of people that you can connect with and share All right. lessons a, with. A, why is this the first time I'm hearing you have a sister? <laughs> B, that she's a teacher. C, that she's a social studies teacher. <laughs> and D, I, we've never been connected with each other. <laughs> she doesn't live on the world of uh, ed tech what, or what social studies. What planet does she live on? Oh, okay. <laughs> she's so, so much younger too. Um, so we'll leave that side of the conversation kind of out here <laughs> in case she listens. Um, <laughs> but um, she would be really great to connect with. I think she could really benefit from a lot of that tech. But I think I think what she found was she ended up joining like a Facebook group or something and and kind of started connecting with people, knowing that she's not alone. And I think I think even it, your job hunting, anything that you do in life, like you just don't have to do this alone. And that you, we're in a very virtual world. It's not going to go away, right? At some point, we're going to have some sort of 3D, we're going to be in some sort of 3D world at some point where we can just like walk up and be like, Hey, Chris, let's like grab a virtual coffee and like actually walk to each other and actually get a virtual fake cup of coffee, you know, and talk over that. I think, I think we just have to evolve. For the and, record, as cool adapt. as that sounds, I have no interest in virtual cups of coffee. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm trying to keep it PG because we're on a, you know, we're talking about education. In my mind, but, it would be like, like a good craft brew, right? You know, you just like go. Oh, no, I get, you, I get that. But know? like, <laughs> this is more valuable. Like, yeah. I don't need to feel like I'm on the holodeck of the Star Trek Enterprise. Right. Right. Like being able to video chat, right? I mean, mm -hmm. this isn't social media, but, you know, social media led to things like this. Right. Right. Where I can talk to, and, and you do this too. You, you create your own content and we can distribute our message and connect and help people all over the world. Yep. And yet people are afraid to jump in. They're afraid to just give it a try, as a wise person once always says. <laughs> yep. And we're going to pause the conversation right here for a quick word from this episode's sponsor. Are you tired of constantly buying disposable flip charts and whiteboards for your presentations, brainstorming sessions, and lessons? Well, the solution to your problem has arrived. Whitebook makes reusable notebooks and flip charts. Their top product, the Wipebook flip chart, is here to revolutionize how you work, teach, and create. Say goodbye to traditional and disposable flip charts and anchor charts, and say hello to more affordable and eco-friendly solutions. With the Wipebook flip chart, you can reuse it over and over again and again. Flipchart is perfect for classrooms and can be an extension of your whiteboards for groups of students to work on. It's two feet by three feet with 10 double-sided sheets. One side is blank, the other is gridded, making it perfect for math classes. The best part? You can write, scan, wipe, and redo, making it an endlessly reusable tool. And with the Wipebook Scan app, you can easily scan and save your work to the cloud giving you access to it whenever and wherever you need it. Head over to wipebook.com slash houseofedtech and enter a weekly raffle 
to win free flip charts or get a discount code for 20% off your purchase. Make the switch to Whitebook. Flip charts are awesome, and if you do it today, you can join the movement toward a more sustainable and efficient way of working. And visit wipebook.com for more information. That's W I P E B O O K.com. And now, back to the show. What would you like to see change in social media? Because I've got some things I want to say, but maybe you've got some things. I think what I would really like to see is obviously more of the, I'm not saying the community doesn't exist, but it kind of feels like it's fallen flat a bit, you know, like I do, I do, I know you hate Twitter chats, but I do sometimes like them because I think it introduces new teachers to these like new threads. But there's um, not a lot of sometimes. new teachers joining Twitter. Yeah. That's right. I, I teach at Rutgers and again, now I'm not working with people who want to become educators but I got to twist their arms to see the value in Twitter, right? What's and, their what's their social media of choice? Uh, TikTok, Instagram, right? And again, th- there are you know areas of both of those platforms that cater to educators, and you can build community on those platforms. Um, but I think it's this got it's I think it's got to be this bigger idea of encouraging teachers who are pre-service to connect, mm, yeah. right? And you know. Someone like uh, Sam Fesich uh, from EduMagic comes to mind. And, you know, I know that she encourages teachers to connect. She does like a virtual mentor program that I've participated in a couple of times pre-COVID where I'm mentoring a teacher out where she teaches in Pennsylvania, you know, while mentoring somebody who's coming to me to my classroom physically. Mm, I do like that perspective, especially because the pipeline is dwindling for teachers coming you know, for people coming into the teaching profession, that could also be a way to kind of bump that up and bolster it and be like, Hey, actually you're going to be mentored by Christopher Nessie of the house of ed tech. And they would be so jazzed and excited because they've, you know, they also want to be paired with influencers. I think sometimes, you know, you know, somebody who is a little bit more visible in the space. And that seems more exciting because you are able to see, because you have so much content that you put out that, People are like, oh, wow. Yeah. Like I definitely want to learn from this person where I'm sure this happened to you, but my, (laughs) my student teaching, I, when I was in the, when I was preparing, it was like the last class before we did student teaching, the teacher that was leading my professor that was leading the class had one of those like uh, one school books, you know, when they would be like in the one room schoolhouse and they would have those. And she wanted us to learn and take passages from this and to prepare lessons from this one school book that had like, you know, was not relevant at all to today's world. And every single resources you had was so dated. But like, if I had been able to connect with somebody who was in the space, you know, yourself or, you know, Carrie Conover, somebody who has been doing stuff with like ed tech for a while, like that to me would have been way more impactful than looking at this book from 1920 when I would have never thought of picking up myself or reading. And it was definitely not relevant to the kids that we service today. So I just think that'd be way more impactful and meaningful. Yeah. I'm just going to piggyback and extend that a bit and say that, yeah, pre-service teachers should be connecting with the people on Twitter. Mm -hmm. I know that at some point this conversation is going to be heard by probably five to 10 pre-service teacher programs. Because I know this podcast gets used in courses around the country. So hello to you who's listening, who is listening to this as part of your homework. You're welcome. (laughs) Um, But you've got to get out there and you've got to really connect. And it takes effort the same Mm -hmm. way it takes effort to foster meaningful face-to-face relationships. Yep. Right? Um, There is value there. And if it's not Twitter, then make it Instagram. If it's not Instagram, then make it TikTok. And I I would say one of my tips is, and not that anybody's asking for tips, but I'm going to throw it out there anyway. You've got to be reciprocal of those who want to engage with you. Mm-hmm. I'm sorry. No, I'm not sorry. For the most part, the people who do this, you are teachers. You are not celebrities. You are not rock stars. You are in no position to not respond to every single person who potentially reaches out to you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now, maybe I don't know the pain of having tens of thousands of followers and getting hundreds of thousands of messages, but I, I'm pretty good about, I don't think I ignore anybody. So, I mean, people reach out to me. I'm willing to jump on these calls and, you know, do that. So I try to model and maybe one day it will get to a point where I can only do for a few what I wish I could do for everybody. But for the most part, 
everybody should be able to help everybody. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think there's a certain hidden gem in the networking piece. And I talk about this a lot on my own podcast about like teachers transitioning. And that's kind of, you know, I get a lot of teachers coming to me and asking about the transition, but I think before that there is a certain level of like, how do I even network? I think that's the trickiest part for people because as these younger students are going, or, you know, any student who's going into, you know, the teacher preparation program, sometimes they don't know how to do it because we spend all of our life in education. And when we interact on social media, it's like, I'm liking this or, you know, commenting on something great. That's not actually how you develop the relationship necessarily. There is a next step. The next step right. is reaching the, the out and kids saying today, they're just yeah. used to swipe left, swipe yep. right. You know, <laughs> yeah, exactly. How do you reach out to, you know, you know, sending somebody a DM is not cringy. You know, if you're reaching out from an aspiring professional to a professional, yep. seeking help, seeking yep. guidance, you know, you've, you've got to put yourself out there. You will only get out of any of these relationships, what you are willing to try to put into it. And I think a lot of the younger teachers today need to have conversations about how to get comfortable being uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. If we're talking about doing that when we're standing up in front of students, then you've got to take that risk and it should pay off when you try to reach out to other people. Yep. And the power of networking just goes, it, it precedes any, any industry, any career pathway, anything that you do, it just leads itself to so many opportunities that you would never even know existed. That's how people get to these like TEDx stages. That's how they get to the top of, you know, being, <laughs> being on the main stage of any platform. It's because they've networked their way there. They don't just sit there in the sidelines and just, you know, hang out and, and whatever, they have to actually send a message. So a, a good example of this would be like, hey, Chris, I really enjoyed listening to the House of Ed Tech. I really enjoyed episode 218 where you talked about AI and how to use it in your classroom. This was my favorite part of the episode. What other tips could you give me as a struggling educator, or as a new educator coming into the platform? It's specific, it's intentional, and it shows that you did your research. Those three things will be elicit an immediate response over somebody who's like, hey, Chris, I'm looking to explore the world of ed tech. Any ad advice? And it's like, well, I have a whole catalog of 218 episodes that you could go back and check out or a catalog of tweets. But being more specific and intentional is the most important part of how to network. And it's uncomfortable. You're not going to get a response from everyone. Just know that depending on the medium that you're interacting with. But it's just the fact of putting yourself out there. It's like what you just said, swiping right and swiping left. Dating is uncomfortable, but people still do it, right? They are still very much in the world. And that is a social media app, if anyone's wondering. Um, if you ever listen to like Land of the Giants, they'll talk of the history of how all those apps kind of came to be. But it's the same thing. Like it's uncomfortable to date, but people don't stop. They just want to do it because they want to find a partner and that's where we do it. So I think you have to think about education in that lens sometimes too, or that that way of connecting in that lens. And and know that I'm sure connecting with a, a, an educator is way easier than trying to get a date in 2023. <laughs> yeah. yeah, probably. <laughs> it's probably much easier and, and probably a little bit more interesting, I hope. Fingers crossed. <laughs> you can't see me, but I'm crossing my fingers. <laughs> um, Lena, do you have any other thoughts on social media? I think a lot of these pre-service teachers, and, and Chris and I have talked about this offline, but I think as a pre-service teacher, as a regular teacher, you do, LinkedIn has kind of become like this overlooked opportunity for teachers and educators to kind of, um, you know, become connected. And I think that especially as like a pre-service teacher, there's so much that you can learn from everything that's happening on LinkedIn because it's more, I know this sounds crazy, it's more professional and a little bit more um, intentional behind the messages, not always. Okay. I need you to sell me more on this because <laughs> I'm on LinkedIn yeah. and I have to, as part of what I do with my college students, they've got to be on LinkedIn and I, I'm just, I'm maybe I'm not spending enough time there, but I'm not seeing what you're starting to describe for educators on LinkedIn. I, I people write articles. I know, you know, some people who like they create their newsletter through LinkedIn, but what kind of engagement can you really have? And otherwise it's becoming more like these other socially based platforms. And I've never perceived LinkedIn to be a place where you have a conversation. Most of the mm -hmm. chat messages I get on LinkedIn are nothing I want anything to do with, let's be <laughs> honest. 
Um, so I need you to sell me first. Mm, so I think that's a good point. I, what I do find about LinkedIn is it's a lot of, a lot of it happens in the comments of people's posts. Um, so let's say I post something about, obviously I work Canva, so this is the most relatable thing, but I might post something about, Hey, we just released this new, I don't know, whiteboards, for example, here's a way to use it. And people will comment and be like, Oh, this is how I've used it. This is how I haven't. But what I actually used to use LinkedIn for as an educator was this. I think that students need to be exposed to a world beyond just me in my classroom. And so it was a way for me to connect with industry professionals to bring them into my classroom and open up the window between education and beyond education. And so I think it depends on the lens that which you're going to. I think it's starting to become what you want it to be. I think it's a little bit far off, but if you become an early adopter of that, I think we'll see more teachers starting to come to the platform. But I think you have to think of it as another way to like network because as teachers, your bandwidth is so, it's full. There's just no other way to say that. So why not bring in an industry professional? If you're looking to talk about chat GPT, I don't know, bring in somebody who's the prompt writers for chat, B, chat GPT and say, Hey, do you want to come speak to my students and talk about how you got here? what sorts of things you've done and how you've kind of seen it evolve and change and iterate over time. And students are going to learn a lot more, not that you're not an expert, but they love to speak to experts in other, in other things. So it's another way to just kind of open that window. Twitter is more of that educational landscape and connecting with other educators or connecting. I would say, keep it tight, like connect with other educators. But I would say on LinkedIn, you have the opportunity to connect with others that are not just educators. Well, I'm not going to say anything to foobar everything you just said. So I think we'll wrap it up there. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, I'd say try it. Um, people like me uh, at Canva would be more than willing to come in and do lessons and speak to your students. So just know that that's available. And, and really what it, what it sounds like is, you know, my, my parents would try to teach me a lesson and, you know, I don't listen. And then I hear from somebody else and mm -hmm. it kind of clicks. Right. So that that's the experts you can you can bring in. Yeah. Well, this was uh, a ton of fun. Yeah, as always. I love being on and, and sharing with you for having me. Awesome. Uh, for anybody who is not connected with you, what are some of the ways that they can reach out and connect and continue to learn and chat with you if they want to network? <laughs> I love that. Uh, LinkedIn is my is my jam, um, but I am on any of the social medias. It's All of them are Lena Marie Sale, and you can also find me on YouTube. Nice. I will include a link to all of that in the show notes for this episode, and that will be out at chrisnessy.com slash 220. Lena Marie, thank you so much for a few minutes here on the House of Ed Tech, and I'll bring you back again. That's great. I can't wait. All right. Talk to you soon. Bye. On the heels of that great conversation I had, I wanted to dedicate this episode's EdTech Thought to the impact of social media on education. So social media has certainly revolutionized the way that we communicate, the way we share information, and the way we connect with other people. In today's world, where technology plays such an important role in just about every aspect of our lives, it is so important for educators like you and me to embrace social media as a tool for not only teaching, but also for learning and, of course, connecting. One of the key advantages of social media for educators is its ability to let us reach a wider audience. With billions, that's billions with a B, people using social media platforms like Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and TikTok, we can share information we can engage with students, and we can collaborate with people from all over the world. Social media can also be used to create a sense of community among teachers. And we know our students are also creating and connecting as well by creating groups or pages dedicated to specific courses or subjects or communities like the House of Ed Tech. Educators like us can foster a sense of belonging and we can encourage our students to share their ideas and collaborate with each other. And we, as educators, can and should be doing the same thing. Social media can be used to keep students up to date with the latest news and developments in the areas of study 
For example, we can share links to relevant articles, videos, podcasts, and all of these things can help our students stay informed and engage with their coursework outside of class time. Remember, as I said in the conversation, our classrooms today don't have walls. Well, they have physical walls, but metaphorically, no more walls. Also, social media can be used to showcase student work and achievements. We should be not only teaching our students how to promote the good work that they're doing, we should be modeling it by sharing photos, videos, and other content on social media, we can highlight the accomplishments of our students and we can inspire others to strive for that same excellence. Finally, social media can be used to provide support and resources to students and teachers who might be struggling with their coursework or with their planning. We know today that teachers are facing challenges more so than any other time in the history of education. Social media can bring us together. We can create a safe and supportive online environment where educators can help each other, and we can also provide support for our students to feel more connected and empowered to succeed. By leveraging the power of social media, we can truly transform the way we teach and help our students achieve their full potential. And that's my EdTech thought. Now it's time for Just Give It a Try. And today I want to talk about Canva websites. That's right. You can make websites on Canva. Canva websites is an all-in-one solution that makes building beautiful, responsive websites easy and hassle-free. With the simple drag-and-drop interface you know and love inside of Canva, you can now use professionally designed website templates, and you can create a site that truly represents you. And your students can use this tool as well. Whether you're looking to create a website to communicate with parents, uh, students showcasing their own work, or you want to share resources with fellow educators, Canva Websites has everything you need. You can easily add photos, links to videos, links to documents, and other multimedia elements to make your web page come alive. Plus, Canva Websites is incredibly user-friendly and accessible, so you don't need any coding or really any design experience to get started. And with a range of customization options, you can tailor your web page to your exact needs and preferences. So why should you try Canva Websites? Again, you can create a stunning website that reflects your style and your vision. You can communicate with parents you can get your students to create easy web pages to showcase their work and their accomplishments. And you can build a maybe a teaching portfolio and showcase your expertise. In summary, Canva Websites is the perfect platform that you need to try, and you should definitely show this to your students as well. So why wait? Try Canva Websites today and see how it can take your teaching and your student learning to the next level. And that's just give it a try. And now it's time to reveal this episode's House of EdTech VIP. I want to give a big House of EdTech shout out and congratulations to Miss Christy Thompson. I had the pleasure of getting connected with Christy recently and we had a recent Google Meet where we talked about podcasting, and she is super excited to get a podcast started for herself in the ed tech space. And I want to tell you a little bit about why you should get connected to Christy and who she is. She's a dedicated educator who has spent the last 22 years teaching 7th and 8th grade social studies. She's taught virtually for the previous two years at the Empower Virtual School in Georgia. She's become an expert in online learning, as well as creating engaging and effective virtual environments for her students. Christy also works as an adjunct professor at Thomas University, teaching classroom technology integration to future educators. She is passionate about incorporating new technology into her own teaching 
and inspiring others to do the same. Christy is also dedicated to teaching and has been recognized with a number of awards. In 2023 already, she was named the Empower Virtual School Teacher of the Year, a well-deserved recognition for her commitment to her students. She was also named Nearpod North Star Teacher of the Year here in 2023, a prestigious honor that celebrates her innovative use of technology in the classroom. And in 2022, she was named the Georgia Education Technology Conference Rising Star, further proving her passion and expertise in the field of education and technology. Overall, Christy Thompson is a highly respected and accomplished educator who is committed to providing the best possible learning experiences to her students and colleagues alike. She is on Twitter. She is at Lady Bugsy, and that's L-A-D-Y-B-U-G-X-I-E. And she also has a great website called cloudedclass.weebly.com. And that's because she's on the verge of getting married, and her last name is going to go from being Christy Thompson to Christy Cloud. So I will have a link to her social media and her website out at chrisnessy.com slash 220. And congratulations to you, Christy. You are a House of Ed Tech VIP. Thank you for listening to this episode of the House of Ed Tech. If you're not subscribed or following, I hope you'll continue to make this podcast a part of your anytime, anywhere professional development. If you want to get the most value out of the House of Ed Tech, check out the show notes for this episode. You'll find links to all the resources mentioned in the show, and this is a great way to deepen your understanding of the topics and take your learning to the next level. Be sure to visit chrisnessy.com slash 220. I love hearing from my listeners, and I value your feedback and your perspective. If you have thoughts or questions about a recent episode or any topic related to education and technology, don't be shy. Email me, feedback at chrisnessy.com, or better yet, leave a voicemail at chrisnessy.com slash voicemail. Your input helps me create better content and improve the podcast. So I encourage you to reach out and share your thoughts with me. I can't wait to hear from you. If you know someone who might benefit from listening to the show, please share it with them. You can easily share a link to the podcast on social media or by word of mouth. Your support helps me reach more people and continue to bring you great content. Thank you for helping me spread the word about the House of Ed Tech. If you want to give back to the show, and you're getting value, consider becoming an awesome supporter. I am very, very thankful for the ongoing support from the following people. Jeff Herb, Peggy George, Dan Gallagher, Mike Messner, Matt Miller, Patty Reefus, Kyle Wilcox, Catherine Abdallah, Brian Carpenter, and Aaron Cummings. If you're getting value from the show, you can become an awesome supporter by visiting chrisnessy.com slash awesome. The next episode of the podcast is going to be episode number 221. Boy, where is 2023 going? <laughs> that episode is going to be about some eco-friendly and cost-effective education technology. And I'm very excited that I'm going to be speaking with one of the co-founders of Wipebook, that's right, the same white book that sponsored the last few episodes. And we're going to talk to Frank Bouchard. And that's going to come your way on March 26th, 2023. Until next time, thank you for learning with me. And remember, using technology is not difficult. I've been telling you this for 220 episodes. So just give it a try. <laughs> <laughs>